In this lesson, we are going to focus on thin-walled pressure vessels. Now, a pressure vessel is a pressurized container which is often cylindrical or spherical. Now, in this topic, we'll usually deal with thin-walled pressure vessels. And then here, a tank or pipe carrying a fluid or gas under a pressure is subjected to tensile forces which resist bursting developed across the longitudinal and transverse sections. Now this figure we see right here, this is the transverse section. And then if we are to rotate this tank, we will now see the longitudinal section, which is this one. Again, this is transverse while this is longitudinal. Now let's first consider this example. Let's say we have a cylindrical container with covers attached at either sides. Now the fluid or gas inside our tank exerts pressure toward the cover plates which are let's say right here and also on the other side. And then since our pressure also exerts a lateral pressure then there's also pressure that acts along the circumference of the tank. And so our fluid here it will exert forces along the sides of the tank. And then these pressures cause bursting. Now these are our covers. Now, let's try to see the isometric view of our tank. It will look like this. In thin-walled pressure vessels, we generally have two types of stress. One that develops along the longitudinal axis due to the pressure the fluid exerts at the covers. And also one that develops along the hoops. Now this is our cover and this is our hoop. Now you may think of a hula hoop because our hoop stress will be along the circumference. Now let's first tackle hoop stress, which is often called tangential stress or circumferential stress. Now, for the purpose of analysis, let's try to remove our cover so that we can reveal the fluid inside. In this simplified analysis, we assume that the weights of the fluid and the vessel can be neglected compared to the other forces that act on the vessel. Now, let's try to illustrate the pressure that the fluid exerts on the side of the tank along the circumference. Now it'll look like this. Now this pressure causes our tank to burst along the longitudinal line. And so to avoid bursting, the tensile stresses in the wall will resist the internal pressure. And then it is what we call the tangential stress or the circumferential or hoop stress. And so now, let's try to cut the vessel in half along the diametral plane or simply the plane where the diameter is. Now we can actually make this cut. And then if we'll do this cut, we'll actually have this figure. Now, if we illustrate the pressures by which our tank is subjected, we have a uniform pressure here due to the fluid. So this will actually have a uniform pressure right here. And then this pressure is caused by the internal pressure due to the fluid. Now we will label this as P. And then, in order to resist the internal pressure, or say, maintain equilibrium, there will be stresses developed along the side walls of the vessel. And so let's just use another color. We will have resisting pressures right here. This is a resisting pressure and also here at the bottom. However, in our analysis, we will just consider the resultant forces of these pressures or stresses. And so if we will change these, we will have this FBD. Now, the wall at the sides of the tank will have a resulting tension force, assuming that the stress distribution is uniform. And then the internal pressure due to the fluid will exert a resultant force F at the centroid. Now, if we are to make sense of our dimensions, we have these. By the way, it's important to note here that the diameter we are considering in thin-walled pressure vessels is the inner diameter. As you can notice, this is the internal diameter. Now for thin-walled pressure vessels, the thickness is so small compared to the diameter such that it's virtually equal to the inner diameter. Now recall that the force F is the resultant of the internal pressure P which is applied along the circumference. Also note here that the small letter P indicates pressure and thus it is not a force. It's instead a stress. And so it will have units of MPA, PSI or the like since it's essentially a stress. Again, stress and pressure are the same. Now, let's first recall that stress is equal to force over area. And so if I want to express force in terms of stress, I can multiply both sides by the area. So times A and then this is times A. So this will cancel. And so our force will just be stress multiplied by the area. This is important in our derivation. Now going back, if we'll equate our horizontal forces, we'll have F is equal to T plus T, or simply F is equal to 2T. So summing up forces horizontal, we have F is equal to 2T. Now this is due to the internal pressure P. Now recall that here, we'll actually use the area on which the pressure acts. And so since our F is due to the internal pressure, this will be our area. Now that'll be the diameter times the length. 
And so expressing F in terms of the pressure, we have P multiplied by this area, which is the diameter multiplied by the length. Again, this is just a rectangular area. And so this is just essentially our stress multiplied by the area. I hope this is clear. And so this is equal to 2 times the tensile force. Now in here, we will just be using stress times area. Now sir, what will be the stress that we will use? We will actually use the tangential stress because the stress developed here, that's our circumferential stress. And so we have the tangential stress multiplied by the area. Now our tangential stress acts on the sidewall of the tank. And so the area will be the thickness multiplied by the length, which is essentially this area. Thickness times the length and so this is t times l now let's try to look at what we can cancel here since l is on both sides of the equation we can cancel that so this will be removed and also this one and then to get the tangential stress we can just actually divide both sides by 2t and so let's divide this by 2t and also this one and so this will cancel and then we have pd over 2t is equal to the tangential stress and so this is our formula. Now, if an external pressure is present, then the P that we'll use is the effective pressure, which is the internal pressure minus the external pressure. Now, sir, why will we subtract the external pressure? Notice that if we have an external pressure acting at the side of the tank, it will help compress the tank. And so if I am to illustrate that, we have this external pressure. Notice that if we have this pressure, this will add some amount of resistance to bursting. And so that's why the effective pressure is reduced. And so that's why we'll subtract this. Because of this added resistance, that will help our vessel resist bursting. And so let's move on to the other type of stress experienced in our vessels, which is the longitudinal stress. Now for longitudinal stress, we can consider the free body diagram in the transverse section of the tank. Now for longitudinal stress, the internal pressure is exerted on the cover of our thin-walled vessel. Now what will resist bursting along the circumference or along the girth of the tank? It will actually be this portion. This will help resist the bursting of the covers. And so to demonstrate that, this is our FBD. We have our force F acting at each side of the tank toward the covers. But let's just actually analyze this part, which is the rear end of the tank. Now, since the wall of the tank will resist bursting, there will be stresses developed along the circumference. And so let's go back. The total force acting at the rear of the tank, which is F, must equal the total longitudinal stress on the wall. Now, the stress on the walls of the tank will look like this. And then the total force F acting at the rear of the tank, which is this one, it must equal the total longitudinal stress on the wall. Now in analyzing this one, we'll just actually consider another resultant, which is, let's say, T. Now this resultant force is just due to this pressure. Now, if the wall thickness T is sufficiently small compared to the diameter of the vessel, these stresses are almost uniform throughout the wall thickness. Or in simple terms, if D over T, or the diameter divided by the thickness, is greater than or equal to 20, the stresses between the inner and outer surfaces of the wall will vary by less than 5%. Now for thin-walled cylinders, the cross-sectional area of the wall can be approximated by the mean circumference times the thickness. Now what do you mean by mean circumference? The mean circumference, or let's say CM, it corresponds to the mean radius of the vessel. Now sir, what is the mean radius? Let's say we have this section. This is our thin-walled vessel. Now this is our inner diameter, and then this is our outer diameter. Now let's just label this as RI, and the outer diameter as RO. Now this is the circumference of the inner diameter, and then this one, it's the circumference of the outer diameter. Now if we talk about the mean radius, it will be right here, at the center. Now recall that this is our thickness, and so if this is the mean radius, let's say Rm, that'll be Rm is equal to the inner radius plus half of the thickness. Now this is what we are supposed to use. However, for thin-walled vessels, we can use the approximation Rm is equal to the inner radius. And so that's why in our derivation, we'll just actually use the inner radius, which corresponds to our inner diameter. And so we have to take note of this. And so let's first analyze this force. Now the force F is just the internal pressure multiplied by the area on which it acts. 
And so that'll be this area, which just corresponds to the inner diameter. And so this is P times the area, which is pi d squared divided by 4. And then this is our inner diameter. And so our F will be P times pi over 4 d squared. Now how about T? Now this resultant force comes from the longitudinal stress. And so if I will express this in terms of the stress, this will be the longitudinal stress multiplied by this area. Now in actuality, that will be pi times the outer diameter squared divided by 4 minus pi times the inner diameter squared divided by 4. However, since we will just use an approximation here that the total area is just virtually equal to the inside area, then we won't actually use this. Instead, our area will just be the circumference multiplied by the thickness. And so the circumference is equal to pi d, and then we'll multiply that by the thickness. However, this isn't the actual area, but the difference is just negligible, and so that's why we'll just use this area. And so our t will become the longitudinal stress multiplied by pi dt. Again, in our assumption here, our inner diameter is significantly greater than t. And so that's why we are just approximating. Now the purpose that we are approximating is so that we can simplify our formula. And so if we are to put this in equilibrium, the summation of forces equals zero, we have F is equal to T. And so our F is the internal pressure times pi over four multiplied by D squared. And then our T is the longitudinal stress multiplied by pi DT. And so notice here that pi will cancel. And then since this is D squared and this is D, we can also cancel 1d, and so this will be removed, and instead of squared, that will be removed, and so this will also be cancelled. And so we have p times d divided by 4 is equal to the longitudinal stress multiplied by the thickness. And so dividing both sides by t, I will be able to get the longitudinal stress, since this will cancel. So we have the longitudinal stress is equal to PD divided by 4T. However, be careful when applying this formula because this is only applicable for cylindrical vessels. If we have other shapes, then we can't use this formula. And so now, comparing our equations for tangential and longitudinal stress, we see that the tangential stress is twice as large as the longitudinal stress. And so it follows that if the pressure in the cylinder is raised to the bursting point, the vessel will split along a longitudinal line. And thus, when a cylindrical tank is manufactured from curved sheets that are riveted together, the strength of the longitudinal joints should be twice the strength of the girth joints. And so now, we'll move on to another common type of thin-walled pressure vessel, which is in the form of spherical tanks. Now take note here that for spherical tanks, we do not have a longitudinal axis, and therefore we only have a tangential stress or circumferential or hoop stress. Now using the same concepts we discussed earlier, we can put our system in equilibrium by equating F and T. So let's draw our figure, and then we actually have these forces. Now F will be due to the internal pressure, which we'll define as P. And then this pressure, it corresponds to our tangential stress. And so this is due to the pressure at the walls. Now the internal pressure P acts on this area, which is essentially pi times d squared divided by 4. And then our d here is the inner diameter. So this is actually d. And so we have F is equal to t. Our F is the internal pressure multiplied by the area. So this is pi d squared divided by 4 and then this is equal to the tangential stress multiplied by the area on which it acts. Now using the same approximations earlier, this area is virtually equal to the circumference of this circle referring to the inner diameter which is pi times the diameter times the thickness. And so this is pi times d times t. And so we can cancel pi and then we can also cancel d. So this will be removed and then our formula for the tangential stress will be pd divided by 4 and then to remove this, we'll also divide this by t. So this will become 4t. And so the stress in spherical vessels will be PD over 4t. Only this one because we don't have a longitudinal axis. And so in our next videos, I will try to demonstrate the stresses in spherical and cylindrical tanks. And then in another example, let's try to tackle a problem wherein our thin-walled pressure vessel does not take the form of a sphere or a cylinder.